one. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Liverpool City Council's planning committee meeting of Tuesday, the 12th of May. And on screen, I welcome our chair, Councillor Tricia O'Brien. Before I formally introduce the various members of the committee and start proceedings, I do need to conduct a test of IT to confirm everyone present in terms of members can hear and see us. So taking alphabetically through the list, I will bring on Councillor Hansen. Just pin you to the screen, Councillor Hansen. Can you unmute your mic and confirm you can see and hear us? I can hear, hear and see you. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. I will now add that to Councillor Kennedy. I will pin you to the screen. When you see yourself appear, Councillor Kennedy, if you then unmute your microphone and talk and confirm you can see and hear us. Yes, I'm here in present. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. I'm moving now to Councillor Mallard. I'm just going to pin you to the screen now. Can you confirm you can see and hear us? I can see and hear everything, Michael. Thank you. Moving now to Councillor Juarez. If you just wait till you appear on screen, then I'll mute your microphone. Good morning. Can you confirm you can see and hear us? If you just unmute your mic, please, Mena. Good morning. Uh, yes, I can hear you and I can see you loud and clearly. That's magic. Thank you, Mena. Uh, Trish, you can see, see and hear us okay? Yes, I can see and hear everybody okay. Good morning, everyone. And lastly, we have Councillor Conception as well, which I'll bring in now. And I'll bring Captain the Deputy. Good morning, Tony. Can you see and hear us okay? Yes, Mike, I can see and hear everyone. Yes. Thanks, Tony. I'll just move back across to Councillor Thompson, who's on my list now. Councillor Thompson, if you could uh, unmute your mic, can you confirm you can see and hear us okay? Um, yeah, I can see and hear, hear everybody. That's excellent. Thank you, Helen. Uh, just before we move into formal proceedings, just to remind everyone present that uh, unless you're speaking at any given point in time, please keep your microphones on mute. When you do need to span, then we will bring you in on screen to address committee accordingly. We have apologies for absence received from Councillor Radford, and there's no alternate presence on this occasion. Therefore, can I now move us on to our first item of business, the declaration of interests. Do members have any to declare in relation to today's items of business, please? In which case, I can now advise that we also don't have any urgent item of business to consider today. With that in mind and with the agreement of the Chair, I suggest we move promptly on to our first item of business, Agenda Item 3, which relates to number 108, Edinburgh Road, Liverpool 7 in Central Ward. Chair, we have two speakers for this application. If you'd like to introduce them and bring them on screen, please. Yes, our first speaker is um, speaking for the application. He's the agent. Uh, can I invite Joe Crawley to speak? please. Mr Crawley, if you could unmute your microphone, please. Morning, councillors. Um, I emailed through a PDF document maybe a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, it's just a few pages long, a couple of paragraphs and some images at the bottom, just, just addressing the, uh, the concerns that you know, members of the public or members of the committee might have with our HMO application at Edinburgh Road there. And there's I was wondering, would it be beneficial if, if we, if, do we all have access to this PDF? Is it, are we able to bring it up on the screen or? Uh, just bear with us, Mr Crawley, we're going to bring the slideshow on screen for sure. you. Sure, thank you. Pause proceedings. Hmm. Apologies, the, the system is slightly lagging. It will come on shortly for you. Thank oh, it's you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm not much of a morning person, to be honest with you. Now, would it be beneficial if we took five minutes out just to read the uh, just a couple of paragraphs there, or would you like me to dictate the uh, the text on the screen there for you? Excuse uh, me. We've all read our agendas, okay. so that would not be necessary. I understand. 
Okay, very good. Just, Mr. Crawley, as uh, Mr. Secretary, can I also advise you that a copy of your materials have been placed on our website as well. Um, yes. The committee have had sight of this from yesterday, so they are familiar with the content. So if you can summarise the key points, please. I suppose the key points were then uh, just the, uh, the HMOs detracting from the uniform appearance of the conservation area, I suppose, is the, the highest on the agenda there. And... Uh, I mean, we're not looking to alter the external uh, facade of this building in any way. We, we are looking to uh, convert the attic space, but we won't be uh, building any dormers on the front or the back or anywhere. We're just looking to purely put in some Velux windows on the uh, front and rear aspects of the building there. Now, uh, I do appreciate that, you know, conservation areas, we should be, you know, kind of preserving the uh, the original look of the area which is what we're trying to do really it's just with regards to the the windows you know they're not going to be visible from street level as such it's uh when you're on the street level the aspects of the the, the narrow terrace rows don't really allow you much uh, viewing angle to the roof spaces there now i did put on a uh, a, a satellite picture of the uh, surrounding houses now there are many roof windows and quite a few properties uh, you know in a, in a very near vicinity of number 108 edinburgh road there so i, I do appreciate yeah not every property has a, a, a roof window and and maybe we are you know altering an aspect from a satellite perspective but i wouldn't say from a, a street level perspective we'll be altering the uh, the visual uh, impact of the property there so i feel that we, we are in keeping with the area you know we're going to preserve that building as best as we can uh, we're up to about maybe 200 properties throughout the city now and i, I represent a, a large consortium of uh, israeli investors so in the last few years we've probably spent about five million in the city bought a lot of properties we're getting bigger we're, get, we're getting better all the time and you know, we, we, we do preserve all the original features. I mean, we bought some really old properties in town where, you know, we're not looking to gut these properties. We're, we're working with a footprint and we're preserving what we can. So, you know, we've got vast experience in this kind of building work. And uh, so I, I just feel that, yeah, we're looking to make the property into a six bed HMO. Now, it is a, a large property. And I do remember from the last meeting there was a, maybe a concern with regards to the, the lack of uh, family homes in that area. And there is, you know, a few HMOs. Now, I would say that with an inner city suburb like that, it's, these big houses are not really catered to your modern day family. You know, a family unit are looking for maybe a suburban property with a garden. And these properties, they don't have gardens. They just have little kind of uh, yards at the rear. And a lot of them aren't really accessible with the... Uh, with the gated up alleyways and so on so i think for a big property like this that was built over 100 years ago you know it's designed in its original build to accommodate maybe six people up to six people you know four kids two parents in a, in a property so I, I believe that the size of the property will cater for our uh, tenants and each room you know we, we will be you know exploiting the the volume of the property to you know accommodate each bedroom to a you know, an acceptable square meterage. And uh, I think the attic space itself will, will, will add to the building, obviously, but we're not looking to increase the footprints or, or, or the volume of the building as such. We're going to be working well within its constraints. And, uh, yeah, we don't do these HMOs on the cheap. You know, we're, we're not looking for a quick turnaround. We won't be looking to put in, you know, students in there as such. We kind of cater to the, the more professional market. So, you know, if there was maybe a, a group of nurses or, people who are just purely looking for, you know, temporary accommodation in the city, then that's the kind of market we're looking to, really. I mean, we have HMOs all over the city. I count maybe about 40 or 50 at the moment. So we're buying every every few weeks, so the, the numbers are always increasing. But, yeah, we, we're looking more to the professional market. Uh, we, we, can, we don't discriminate on our tenants in a way that, you know, anyone can rent these properties, but... We'll also select our tenants where we feel that they're going to be able to live together. We wouldn't be putting maybe a 55-year-old man with an 18-year-old girl, if you understand where I'm coming from here. So we will be selecting our tenants carefully. We do fully vet them and uh, reference them. And, and, we, and we try and place our tenants in a property. We feel that they're going to you know, get along with their housemates. And 
We've no shortage of properties, to be honest. If, if a tenant needs a room, we'll get them a room, and it could be anywhere across the city. But, you know, it, it, it's generally, we, we kind of look for a household that's going to live in harmony. So I can't imagine any late-night parties, you know, any disturbances around our property. And we've got a lot of staff in the city full-time who are on hand. So if there is any issues, we can always resolve them. You know, the drop of the hat, we're, we're on call 24-7 as a company. So um, I think... I think with regards to, I'm just going through your, uh, the breach of the Article 4 direction. I think that, that that's the, the, the big kind of uh, issue here. And now, if you believe that our, our Velux windows would be detracting from that, then I suppose it's just a case of precedent looking throughout the neighbourhood. And, you know, we're, we're not looking to alter the appearance of this building. It's just pure letting light into the attic space which you know it's a big attic space it, it does warrant a conversion we're not we're not going to be dropping floors as such it's uh yeah I, th I think the volume of the building can handle it now i've surveyed this property myself and many others so you know we've got the right team of builders to make it work and it will be an attractive property by the time we're finished with it um i can't think of anything else to add to the conversation to be honest with you so i'd like to feel some questions if you like now are there any questions from members. No questions, then can I um, hand over now to Councillor Nick Small. Yeah, hello, can people hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, um, I just want to speak against it. Um, Kensington Fields area is about around 1,500, largely Victorian terrace houses. It's the largest and um, Victorian estate anywhere outside of London. It's a conservation area. Around 25 to 30% of all of the homes in Kensington Fields are now um, HMOs, largely student HMOs, but there are some other HMOs there. And I want to talk with some local knowledge based on my role as a city councillor and what I've spoken um, to local residents around this. This application, I think, fundamentally is, is overdevelopment. It's about turning a three-bedroom Victorian family home into a six-bedroom um, HMO. And, and when it's a six-bedroom HMO, there's often going to be what we found is more than six people staying there because people are bringing boyfriends and girlfriends and partners and friends to come and stay there. So what we often see is something that's a six-bedroom HMO often will have up to 12 people um, staying in there a lot of the time. And no matter how well that HMO is managed, and no matter how well the how well intentioned the landlord is, um, what we find is that the houses simply can't cope with um, the pressure of having up to 12 people um, living there. They can't cope in terms of noise, they can't cope in terms of um, environmental services because of this issue around overdevelopment. And that's something that is recognised in the draft local plan um, where we've looked at um, identifying this um, as, a, as a designated concentration um, of HMOs in local plan, allowing us in the future to bring um, an Article 4 around that. Um, there's an impact as well on, on, on the housing market. We are finding that lots and lots of people still want to live in Kensington Fields. Lots of families still want to Ken live, live in Kensington Fields. They want to live there because it's close to the city centre, it's close to Kensington, it's close to the bus route, it's close to the hospitals. Lots of people are working um, in, in, in the hospitals there. There's lots of new UK who want to live in Kensington Fields, who see this as an attractive part of the city to live and want to live in um, the houses as they are in Kensington Fields. We're seeing house prices um, maintaining and, and, and often increasing in Kensington Fields. We've not got an issue of vacant family homes in Kensington Fields. So I reject the argument based on local knowledge that families don't want to live there. They do want to live there, and this is a really popular area to live in. The final point I want to make is around um, heritage. Um, this is a conservation area. It is about um, maintaining um, and preserving and conserving the um, Victorian aspects of the home. The Velux windows aren't, aren't, aren't in character of the conservation area, and that's a really important point. A 
I completely get what the Apple thing says when if you stand outside a house, you can't actually, and you look up, you can't actually see the roof. But what you can see is if you're at the other end of the road, if you're um, standing opposite it, you can see these developed windows and they aren't in character with the rest of the conservation area. There are unfortunately um, some um, developed windows, some dormer windows that have been fitted. Many of them have been done without planning permission um, and, are, and, and are there completely unlawfully. I shouldn't set a precedent about maintaining the Victorian character of the conservation area. The Article 4 does protect that and it's specifically referenced in the um, conservation area. So um, final point to make, I hope based on the local knowledge that I've my experience as a councillor for 16 years, based on um, conversations that I've had with neighbours and local residents in there, um, I believe that there's enough grounds to reject this and I hope that the committee will reject this application today. Thank you, Councillor Small. Can I invite any questions from members of the Planning Committee next, please? Seeing as there don't seem to be any questions, can I now hand over to our Planning Officer? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Can everybody see and hear me? We can. Excellent. Uh, so my name is John Hayes. I am the team leader for development management in the north of the city. Uh, Chair, you've got a very full report in front of you that sets out all the issues in some detail. Um, and obviously with this being a house in multiple occupation application, um, there is probably very little that I can usefully add to the many debates that this committee has had on many occasions, um, including in relation to properties within the Kensington Field Conservation Area. Um, so just go through very quickly a number of uh, observations, if you like. Um, the first is that this is an application for a six-bedroom house in multiple occupation. As members are aware, um, a property uh, of up to six people living together um, as an HMO would not ordinarily require planning permission. However, uh, as we put in the description of development, uh, and as Councillor Small has pointed out, it is facilitated by the conversion of the roof space by the insertion of a number of roof lights. And because this is in a conservation area, those roof lights uh, do require uh, consent. The issue that Councillor Small has raised around heritage is addressed in your report, particularly at paragraph 3.3. The heritage specialist within the council has considered this carefully. Um, his view is that given the changes that have been made to the property, already, including, for example, the rendering of the property and the removal of uh, a number of bay windows, that the uh, insertion of additional roof lights would not harm the character of the conservation area, given those changes that have already taken place. So this is um, being considered on its particular merits. It does not of itself set a precedent for other applications for roof lights within that Kensington Fields conservation area. Um, I think that's probably as much as I want to say, Chair. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions from members? Okay, there don't seem to be. So, can I move that the recommendation is approved? Is that agreed? Thank you, Chair. Just in terms of the voting procedures, I will go through each of the members of the committee in turn. And once you appear on screen, I would ask you to confirm your vote on the item concerned. So taking Councillor Hanson firstly, I'm just going to pin you to the screen. When you appear, thank you, Councillor Hanson. Can you confirm your vote on the chair's oh. motion? Thank you. Councillor Thompson, we come to you now. Can you confirm your vote, please? Agree. Thank you. Coming now to Councillor Kennedy. Can you confirm your vote? I agree. Thank you. Coming now to Councillor Marat.
for thank you coming out to councillor Juarez against thank you Coming now to Council of Conception. Could you confirm your vote, please, Tony? Just unmute your mic, please. Four. Thank you. And Chair. Vote, please. Four. Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm the voting on the application, that is six in favour and one against with no abstentions. Therefore, the motion is carried and the application approved on that basis. And if we can now move on to our next item of business, which is item number four on the agenda, related to number 87, Halsbury Road, Liverpool 6 in Kensington and Fairfield Ward. Um did have down that Councillor Liam Robinson was going to speak, um, but due to the size of the video that he wanted to speak to us on, uh, we need to summarise what he had to say because we cannot show it. So I'll hand over now to Michael Jones, our committee clerk. Thank you, Chair. And if I could ask uh, my colleagues to display images of the site on screen at this point as well, just wait for those to appear. Just go on to the next slide, please. As you can see on the images on screen and on behalf of the issues raised by Councillor Robinson, he, he, on behalf of local ward colleagues, expresses a number of concerns over this development. Principally, as you can see on screen, that works have already commenced on site prior to the application being considered or determined by this committee, which he considers sets an unfortunate precedent and is not acceptable in terms of not respecting the planning process. Additionally, Councillor Robinson considers that the scale of the extensions and proposed works to the property are excessive and not in keeping with that of the adjacent area, to the extent that these will result in the property being over-occupied and which will in turn have a negative impact on the amenity of adjacent neighbours and occupiers, as well as on future potential occupiers of the site itself. So there are some concerns also raised by Councillor Robinson in terms of the impact on the ability to store refuge within the curtilage of the site and the impact on drainage facilities running to and from the property, which would in turn impact on adjacent occupiers as well. As you can see on screen, there's a number of floor plans displayed clearly showing the uh, layout of, of the uh, premises. Obviously, Councillor Robinson has viewed these prior to today's meeting and would express concerns that for the scale and size of the premises, he feels that the number of occupants and the proposed number of rooms is excessive and have a negative impact on the adjacent area. And that concludes the representations on behalf of Councillor Robinson. Chair? Thank you for that summary. Um, we have no um, other objectors or people wishing to speak, so I hand over to our planning officer. Thank you again, Chair. Members, again, you've got a very full report in front of you. Uh, again, these are matters that are familiar to this planning committee. Um, in, in relation to the issue about work commencing prior to the grant of planning permission, um, I would point out that the works that were shown on that photograph uh, appear to me to constitute permitted development. And certainly, we have replicant uh, many applications in the past where they have submitted separate applications for confirmation that works that they intend to carry out are indeed permitted development uh, and then gone on to seek applications separately uh, for the change of use to an HMO. In this particular case, they've obviously bundled everything up into the single planning application. Um, and, and obviously that is now before you uh, this morning. Uh, but just to confirm, Chair, that 
the the work shown on the plans and on that photograph do appear to constitute permitted development and would not of themselves therefore require planning permission. Um, the other issues, Chair, around HMOs, again, as I said earlier, are familiar to you. Happy to answer any questions that members may have. Are there any questions from members of the planning committee? I would like to ask something, Chair. Yes, please, Councillor Kennedy. Um, well, a number of things, but the main thing is, it, it seems to me to be one of these applications where we talk about which actual plans have any impact, which policies have any impact. So, within the report, it talks about the local plan has limited weight, uh, weight. Um, whereas the local plan as such would uh, tend to move against uh, this particular application. But however, the older policy on SPG 7, we're told, is outdated. So, so that can have limited weight. Uh, the question is, if the more recent policy is can only be given limited weight and the the older policy can only be given limited weight, what policy can we give weight to? So I'll hand over to our planning officer, if I may, to answer you. Um, by law, decisions have to be made in accordance with the development plan. So the development plan as it stands at the moment is the unity development plan and obviously that is some um, of some age now. Um, the supplementary planning documents that underpin that or augment the policies within there again are quite old now. Um, and obviously we are looking to progress matters through the uh, local plan uh, and that is going through the statutory process at the moment with an inquiry expected soon. Um, the guidance that is provided by government suggests that uh, the further in the process that the local plan is, the greater the weight that can be attached to it, but also having regard to representations and comments made in relation to those uh, various policies within the document, within that local plan. Um, the experience of your officers um, in trying to apply the policies of the local plan, particularly in relation to um, properties in multiple occupation has been that limited or only very moderate weight can be given to the new policies that are emerging through that local plan and inspectors invariably fall back to the policies that are in the statutory document which is the UDP. Um, your officers do always try and push for those higher standards um, and if I'm right I think the uh, standards are actually met in any case in relation to this um, particular uh, application in terms of its overall room sizes. Um, so for that reason, Chair, we have recommended it for approval. Um, I'm not sure that answers uh, Councillor Kennedy's question. Uh, happy to respond if necessary. Councillor Kennedy, does that adequately answer your question? I think I think that answers uh, my question. It, it, it was just that in paragraph 211, the report says it complies with the policy, but we were basically saying that policy is outdated and, uh, and it caused some um, cause for concern with me. Um, there is also the, the question of light, which is similar to the, the previous application, um, where some of the rooms do not have eye level uh, lighting and just require, uh, or just provide light from the ceiling as it were. Um, uh, maybe a, a, a few comments on, on that would uh, help. There is something in the report about <coughs> landlord licensing um, application. Um, reading here from Spain, I understand that the Landlord licensing scheme is under some threat, and I wondered whether that applied. 
Um, would you like to um, answer those points, um, please, for us, John? Um, but also, as we know, John, a lot of this is based on what the planning inspector have come back to us um, with every time we've tried to pick up on these points. It, it, indeed, Chair. Uh, absolutely, Chair. And, and, and that's, I think, the point that I was uh, trying to emphasise um, earlier. Um, in relation to the roof lights, Chair, the, the, there is a section in the report that deals with that. Um, again, the, the policy within the UDP and indeed taking it forward through the local plan tries to discourage um, the use of rooms that are lit entirely um, by roof lights. Now, the reason for that is that it does not provide an adequate outlook uh, for those particular properties uh, or those particular rooms, I should say. Um, However, um, in discussing these applications with uh, the applicants, um, amendments are often made to lower the position of the roof lights so that they do afford a degree of outlook. So they are lower down so that, the, that there is actually a view out of that um, particular room. Um, and for those reasons, Chair, your officers uh, accept that they do provide a satisfactory level of amenity. The concern arises where um, there is no outlook. There is just simply light coming through from, from a roof light, uh, but there is no visible outlook. So uh, in this particular case, again, the roof lights have been set at a position uh, that allows a view out of the room um, into the wider environment. Uh, and again, we're satisfied that that affords a suitable level of amenity for the wider property. Um, in relation to landlord licensing chair, um, I don't know what the current position is. Ultimately, however, you are to assess the application on its planning merits. Uh, the landlord licensing would be a separate matter ultimately. Again, ha happy to answer any further questions, chair. Are there any further questions? Thank you. So I would like now to move that the recommendation be approved. Is that agreed? Thank you, Chair. And we move to the voting processes as per our previous item. So starting firstly with Councillor Hanson, who I will bring onto screen now. Councillor Hanson, we can see you now if you could confirm your vote. No. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, just putting on screen now, if you could confirm your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Kennedy, I'll come to you now. I'll just put you on screen. If you can confirm your vote, please. Given the answers to the, the questions, uh, four. Thank you. Councillor Marat, just put you on screen now. If you can confirm your vote. Four. Thank you. Next to Councillor Juarez. Against. Thank you. Councillor Conception, you're on screen now. To confirm your vote. Oh. Thank you. And if we can revert to the chair. If you confirm your vote, please, Chair. Thank you. Just to confirm the voting on that application, that is six in favour, one against. Therefore, the recommendation is carried and the application approved on that basis. In terms of our published agenda for today's meeting, I'd also remind members and those public watching online that item number five relating to rail land to the south of Fazakali Station in Longmore Lane in Fazakali Ward, that particular application has been withdrawn from consideration at today's meeting at the request of the Head of Planning. That will now be determined at a future meeting of this committee. With that in mind, we'll therefore move on to our next item of business, which is number six on today's agenda, and relates to Erskine Street in Liverpool 6. Chair? So there have been no requests um, from the applicant or local ward councillors or members of the public to address the committee on this application. So I will hand straight over to our planning officer, please.
Can our planning officer come in? Yeah, now, yeah. I, I can hear you, Trish. I'm just waiting to come up on screen. Right. OK. Thank you, Fergal. Uh, thank you, Chair Fergal McAvoy, Team Leader for City Centre Development Management Team. The application in front of you today is a proposal to erect a 20 metre high street works monopole column together with supporting antennae and dishes and two standalone ground based cabinets on a green piece of car uh, green piece sited between two carriageways when members will be familiar with the site when traveling out of the city center along Islington before you reach Edge Lane Drama, before you reach Edge Lane and Prescott Road. It occupies a piece of land there. There have been a number of objections from three local residents and also supported by Councillor Tulin on the grounds of radiation, safety and environmental issues. These issues have been addressed within the detailed report which is in front of you on today's agenda and there's they raise issues that have kind of previously cropped up and been addressed at previous planning committees in respect proposals for 5g telecommunity so unless uh, members have any further questions they may answer today as i said there's a full and detailed report in front of you where all the issues and concerns raised have been addressed Thank you, Fergal. Are there any questions for our planning officer? No? Well, in that case, um, can I move that the recommendation be approved? Is that agreed? Thank you, Chair. Moving now into the vote, we will take Councillor Hanson firstly. So, Councillor Hanson, you will be coming on screen now. If you could confirm your vote, please. Oh. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Councillor Thompson. Yes. Councillor Thompson, your vote? Four. Thank you. Councillor Kennedy. Agreed. Thank you. Move now to Councillor Marat. Four. Thank you. Next to Councillor Juarez. Four. Just you can reconfirm your vote while you're on screen, please. Please go on. Go ahead. Four. Thank you. Councillor Conception, you're coming on screen now. If you can confirm your vote. Four. Thank you. And lastly, it's over to the chair, please. Four. Thank you, Chair. And just for the record, that confirms the votes of seven in favour, no votes against, no abstentions, and the application is therefore approved on that basis. And we will therefore move on to our final item of business, which is item number seven on today's agenda, which is the grass verge adjacent to the new Mersey Retail Park, Speak Road in Speak Garston Ward. Chair, please. There have been no requests from the applicant or their agent to address the committee in support of this application. But we now have one objector who has pre-registered to address the committee. And if I could invite Lindsay um, to come and address us, and you have up to three minutes to speak, Lindsay. Thank you, Chair. We have sought to make contact with the objector on this occasion, and they have had an invitation, but they are not present this morning. What I would refer members of the committee to, however, is to your tabled update notes, which is also published online for reference by members of the public, and which includes a number of written representations made by the objector, and which a number of responses are provided also by the head of planning on that regard as well. So you will have that before you. So can I hand over to our planning officer to address the committee now, please? Thank you, Chair. Can I, everybody see and hear me? We can, we can do. Thank Stuart. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, uh, Stuart Clark, team leader of the South team. Um, as per the previous application, 
This is a 20 meter high telecommunications mast to deliver a 5G rollout for Telefonica. Um, it's to be in addition to an existing 4G mast, which will be located some 30 meters away. Um, but given the commercial location of this, this mast, with the backdrop of the retail park, which has large buildings and high street um, like parking, parking street like columns in the car park, we're happy that there's a very limited visual receptors from residential properties that would be affected by this. Um, and there's also four lanes of traffic between three grade two star listed buildings opposite. So we're satisfied that the visual impact of this um, are acceptable having regard to the benefits of the rollout of the 5G network and the wider social benefits that brings. Um, so we're happy to recommend approval, Chair, um, but happy to answer any questions if anybody's has any. Are there any questions from members of the planning committee? Yes, Chair, I would like to ask a question. Uh, over to you, Councillor Juarez. Thank you. Um, the current equipment that's there at the moment, will that still remain while this uh, new antenna is put up? Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, on this particular on this particular operator, which is Telefonica, um, you, you may recall you've dealt with quite a few of these over the last six or seven months, which have been by a different operator, which is 3 and EE, and they mass share. They, they basically have a slightly wider mast, um, and it, but it accommodates both operators. Telefonica um, have opted, because of the design and their supply of their masts, that they need to do separate masts. So the one that's already there, unlike the 3 and EE solution, will remain. That will remain a Vodafone mast. And it's likely, although I can't be guaranteed, that at some point in the future, Vodafone will come forward to upgrade that one to a 20 metre high one as well. So this is slightly different to the ones you've dealt with previously in so far that you would still have two masts in relative proximity to each other. But given the commercial location in this particular instance, and the lack of visual receptors from residential properties, we're satisfied that this particular location can handle two masts of that height, given the commercial backdrop. Councillor Juarez, uh, have you been answered adequately on that? Um, can I ask an, uh, another question, Chair? Yes, certainly. In terms of width, are these structures, are they uh, wider than the previous structures? So these masts, are they going to be, are they wider than what they were traditionally uh, the last? They are, they are wider because they, they're taller, so they've got to be wider to support the actual weight and the height of the mast. They're not as wide as the three and EE ones, um, because they're, they're even wider again because of the, they carry 12 antennae. This only carries half the antenna, but it's still probably about, I think it's about half a metre in width, whereas the existing pole is probably 300 mil in width. So they are wider, but not, not unless you're really looking at it, it, you wouldn't really perceive it massively driving past or something like that. And given a commercial location, it's not something that, as I say, visually somebody's going to be looking out their window at every day sort of thing. So on this particular occasion, because of the commercial situation and the backdrop of large buildings and taller lighting columns in the car park or the retail park, we're happy that the visual impacts are still outweighed by the benefits. Um, yeah. yeah, not, not much more um, I can add here. Yeah, um, my concern is, you know, I, I I do use this highway, this um, this road, quite a lot myself, and it's quite a busy um, route for uh, freight uh, in and out of this city. So it's quite an important road, really, Speak Road, um, that, you know, my main concern is that, you know, there is quite a bit of uh, accidents that take place on this road. So th when this road gets clogged up, it means that, you know, goods um, are can be delayed for hours on this road. You know, the general public traveling to and from work, um uh get delayed because of um possible accidents um why why does the applicant want to be at that specifically that specific location in that roundabout 
Um, why did they not think about moving towards the side of estuary, uh, the estuary business park? Why that location? Why that roundabout? Chair, yeah, um, the, the, the actual mast is not going to be located in the roundabout. Um, it's in the grass verge. So it's it's by Marks and Spencers and Argos. By way of assistance, uh, colleagues, uh, I'm just going to bring up a plan showing the location. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. For some reason, I um, envisaged it to be in that um, in the roundabout. Sorry, it's my uh, reading of the agenda, but now I can see on the plan that yeah, it's on the grass verge, which is uh, a lot different to what I thought. Yes, and if I can come in now, we've we've uh, learned in the past about these masks. That, um, um, we have limited areas where they can go, have to be certain distances away in order to maximise the signal to the surrounding area. And I think all this was considered uh, when we read our planning agendas. So unless there are any other questions from any other members, I'm going to move to the vote. Can I move that the recommendation be approved? Is that agreed? Thank you, Chair. Coming firstly to Councillor Hanson, who I'll put on screen now. Councillor Hanson, could you confirm your vote? No. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, coming on screen shortly. Four. Thank you. Councillor Kennedy. Thank you. Councillor Marat. Thank you. Councillor Waters. Thank you. Councillor Conception. Oh. Thank you. And lastly, to our chair, please. Four. Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm the outcome of the vote, that is seven members in favour, none against, no abstentions, and the application is therefore approved on that basis. And that concludes our business for today. So thank you to all those people who've joined our virtual planning meeting. I'll hand up. Thank you, Chair, and I echo those comments and thank everyone for attending and viewing our live stream today. And just to confirm, that concludes today's live stream and proceedings.